on Robin Hood Radio. We're about to interview someone who's going to be appearing in our area, as a matter of fact. Uh, Trigger Hippie, performing at Infinity Hall in Norfolk, Connecticut, on November 7th. And uh, with us is Steve Gorman. Uh, Steve, uh, first of all, thanks for joining us today. Uh, it's a pleasure, sir. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. You know, I, I was looking into your background here, and uh, not only as a musician, but uh, you're you're varied in in what you do. I, I love to see uh, your your radio career with uh, that basically spanned, oh, I think five or six years from on on Fox Sports Radio. Uh, yeah. <laughs> how did that happen? How did that show ever come about? Well, I was always a sports fan. Okay. I was originally a broadcasting major with my thoughts in my you know late teens where I'd be a sportscaster. So it was something that was always sort of in play in the back of my mind. But then, you know, I hadn't thought about it. You know, once the Black Crows took off, that was the furthest thing <laughs> in my mind. But I moved to Nashville in 2004, and I found myself listening to Sports Talk Radio, and I just had this notion that musicians talking about sports would be an interesting, you know, unique alley to go down. And I sat in with the local sports show a few times. I made friends with a guy that was on the air, and he had me on. And his PD said, you should come back once a week. You're great. And I said, well, I'd rather have my own show. And he just went, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's like literally that simple. So he just gave me Sunday nights for a while. And off and on for a couple of years, I'd go in there and try it out and see what I thought. And eventually it turned into a daily show. And then in 2013, Fox Sports Radio picked it up nationwide. Well, I think that's, that's an interesting aspect, uh, that, that uh, your interest in broadcasting. And, of course, then the Black Crows, we'll talk about that. I mean, I guess once th something like that takes off, everything else very quickly does get in the rearview mirror. You have no choice in that matter. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Now, was that... Yeah, it was... Uh, I, like, when I say it was the furthest thing from my mind, that's, 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 that's literal. I mean, it was... Like you said, when that thing gets going, that's the only thing anyone's thinking about. So, so tell us your experience before we, we before we get to uh, Trigger Hippie. Uh, your experience with the Black Crows. I mean, uh, surprise, happy. Uh, it, it, I don't think people realize the amount of work that goes into being a, a successful a touring musician in a very successful band. No, and it's it's important, honestly. If you want to do it the way we did it, you better have it start young because by the time you're twenty six, twenty seven you've had enough life experience to realize this is no way to live. But when you're 21 and 22, you think, all right, I'll do anything to make it. And, you know, that, that's helpful to make it, and it's also really hurtful long-term as far as the culture it establishes within a band. We were not a healthy band in any stretch of the, of the word. I mean, the music was good. You know, the music was very strong, and that was everyone's focus. But we left a lot of things along the way to sort of fester. And, and ultimately, that band was a kind of a classic case of addiction and codependency and loyalty and betrayal and you know it's a pretty shakespearean situation at the end of the day and it ultimately unwound itself and you know i got out in a good place i had a lot of ups and a lot of downs but um you know i asked for every bit of it so you know no regrets but i certainly learned a lot all right now where uh, were you big trigger happy where did that name come from um it just hit me one day we were doing a gig the trigger hippie started the bassist, Nick Govrick, and I started playing together 15 years ago. And about 10 years ago, we were, I mean, we were doing gigs in town here in Nashville. And the gig was usually me and Nick and whoever was available. It was just a place, a way to jam. You know, we loved playing together. And it was kind of like, here's a great rhythm section. Who wants to come jam with us? And so there's a million guitarists in Nashville, of course. So we always had people show up and sit in with us. And then we started writing our own songs, and we started thinking about it in terms of, let's turn this into an actual band. And we were doing a gig in 2009, so it's 10 years ago, and it was just a, it was just a benefit gig in Macon, Georgia, for the Allman Brothers Big House Museum. And Jimmy Herring from Whitesburg Panic was with us, and you know it was just going to be a night of covers and jamming. And on the way down there, I said, we should just call this thing Trigger Happy, because Jimmy just plays... He can solo for 13 hours, and it was just awesome to let him go and just watch him go. And I said, let's call this Trigger Happy. And then I said, no, actually, Trigger Hippie's kind of funny. And it just stuck, and it's never, we just said, oh, that's a good name, let's keep it. So everything Nick and I have done ever since has been called Trigger Hippie throughout, you know, and it was still a loose collective. We had several lineups. The difference between the past and right now is we put this lineup together with a specific goal, with a real vision for this becoming a full-time band. And that had never happened before. So that's really the big 
the big difference uh, right now moving forward is that we're 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 we have a sense of what we want this to be, and we have a, a very clear vision, and we have people that share that vision. So we're hoping that this is something we can turn into a full-time touring and recording band. Well, with Trigger Happy, do you think that what you learned from being in the Black Crows really is the thing that probably postponed you for so many years from, form from forming another actual set band, or or, or had you put yeah, the... I, well, yeah, for sure. You know, there was a lot of, you know, you can put square pegs in round holes, and you can be really good at it, but at the end of the day, it's still a square peg in a round hole. And so, as I got older, oddly enough, what I've become is far more patient, and I'm willing to wait for something that genuinely feels right rather than just say, this is good enough, or try to talk myself into thinking it's right. And so as we made this album, with every individual song, with the people we were playing with, everything between me and Nick was, hey, this feels right, or it doesn't. And we were in agreement the whole time, and we didn't push anything. We didn't force anything. So, you know, I, I'm a big believer, and you can go, you know, you can go faster alone, but you can go much further together. So we'll take it at the pace that makes the most sense. Um like we have a vision and we have goals, but we don't have a timeline. If that makes sense. Oh, it makes it. It makes. Uh, hey, uh, my my partner and I started a nonprofit radio station eleven years ago. We have a vision, and a goal, and uh, there is no timeline. It's it, it's been evolving right. over eleven years, and it will continue to evolve for however long we do it. It's just. Uh, well, that's man. Kudos to you. That is not. An, it's a, I mean, you know, talk about people don't know how hard it is to get a band up and run, and that's that's also a very very. That's a slippery slope, man. That's tough terrain. Congratulations. <laughs> All right. So now, you know, we're, once again, we are speaking with uh, Steve Gorman, uh, Trigger Hippie, performing at Infinity Hall November 7th uh, in Norfolk, Connecticut. Uh, and, and looking back at, you, at your broadcast background, but before you you delved into that, has music always been a part of your life? I mean, when I was growing up, uh, I in grammar school, I tried to sing, and my music teacher said, You're just not going to make it. And he, 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 he introduced me to the guitar and to the saxophone, and I became a, a musician that way. And then becoming a musician, mm -hmm. I got into radio. I mean, was music always a part of your life when you were young? Uh, yeah, not not playing it, but 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 an obsessive mm -hmm. fan. And you know, I, I'm, I'm the youngest of eight kids, so there was a lot of albums in the house, and everybody's personal record collections kind of went in every direction. You know, I had a prog rock brother and a soul R and B brother and a punk and new wave brother. So I had a huge amount of music going on at all times. And I just soaked it up and was, I was a kid who obsessively listened to records and always wanted to play drums. I didn't start playing. The first time I sat down at a kid, I think I was 18 and I didn't buy my own drum kit till I was 21. But I had spent literally every day of my life since the age of five or six thinking about drumming, pretending I was drumming, air drumming, you know, obsessing over how drums work and what the role of a great drummer is. Um, I just didn't have an opportunity to do it. And as soon as I did, you know, there was no turning back because that was truly the only thing. Like I said, I was a broadcasting major, but the whole time I was doing that, my thought was, God, but I'd do anything to be in a band. You know, that's all I ever really wanted. Well, once again, Trigger Hippie is uh, coming to Infinity Hall on November 7th. I uh, now... The music business is a lot different than than when you got into it. Now, uh, you're you're doing this this tour, the, the, these gigs, and you actually have a brand new record out, right? Yeah, we do. Full circle, and then some came out about about two weeks ago. We released it. All right. Is it? Uh, do you like the music industry the way it is now, or did you like it the way it was ten, fifteen years ago? Um, you know, it's funny. I don't. I never think about it in terms of what I prefer. It just is what it is. Yeah. I mean, you know, everybody, when, when the Black Crows first record came out in 1990, we were surrounded by people who were decrying the death of the music industry. Yeah. You know, oh, it's not like it was 10 years ago. And what I've noticed for 30 years is everybody thinks 10 years ago was a lot better. Um, I, it, it really isn't something that, that concerns me. I mean, I can't do anything about yeah. it. I can't change it. All you can do is work with the, the realm that you're in. And it doesn't change my my motivation and it certainly doesn't change our our reasons for doing this for playing this music and being in this band i mean that that's the same thing as it was when we were all kids you know let's let's start a band let's let's have a rock and roll band and let's go to play let's write songs and let's go tour and let's go play music for people i mean that that never changes no matter what the distribution system for your records are and that's really the you know and it's and, and i and i say that that's just me i know plenty of musicians who i respect quite 
sincerely who are obsessed with every last detail of how the industry is evolving. But that's just never been something I've spent much time with. And and what's interesting here is that, and this must have been a cathartic experience, uh, your memoir, Hard to Handle the Life and Death of the Black Crows. Right. That Was that something that you uh, you ever expect that you would come out with a memoir, <laughs> memoir when you first started out? No, I, it wasn't really. I mean, I, I had thoughts about it, and other people suggested it for years. It was never anything I wanted to put the time and effort into. Um, but a couple things, you know, the way the band ended in 2014, was a really it was a pretty horrific and embarrassing way to kill a band. Um, not a lot of lead singers have ever demanded all the money for a band moving forward after 27 years, so that was pretty special. And it was that obviously that's a bad taste in my mouth and everybody's mouth associated with the band. And uh, but but that still wasn't the thing. Three years ago, our, our piano player Ed Harsh died, and and I knew the Black Crows were dead at least in my life. I knew that that was never going to come back. It was never anything I wanted to revisit as a as a musician, but Ed's death brought a real finality to the narrative, if you will. Like I, with him gone, it was really easy to see it as a story. You know, my my life in that band became there was a beginning and there was an end, and the end was absolutely the end because there's a you know Ed was a huge part of the essence of that band at its greatest, and that's never going to come back. So it was dead to me, and so that's what. Within a few months of his death, I found myself thinking more and more like, I think I'm going to do this. I think I'm going to do this. And then one day I just started doing it. And then now, you know, three years later, we have a book out. Well, once again, uh, uh, Trigger Hippie uh, at Infinity Hall in Norfolk, Connecticut on November 7th, infinityhall.com on the web. Uh, Steve, thanks for taking a few minutes and joining us today. And uh, and hey, good luck on, on your tour and on, on your book and uh, on your brand new record. Well, thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. If you make it to the gate, come back and say hey. All right, will do.